awesome. Cool. Hi, y'all. Good to see you. Um, first, I just wanted to remind you that I exist. I'm here, and I'm here for you, and I'm a resource that can be utilized at Launch Code and um, remind you of what I do and who I am, uh, in case you don't remember, which is um, I'm a success coach, and uh, that functions a lot of different roles, but uh, the way that I see it is I'm coming from, I just graduated my social work program, um, so I'm like a real social worker now, and I'm here to provide resources and support in, in many different ways. Um, I uh, can help you with time management, I can help you with general resources if you um, feel like there's a need for help from an organization in St. Louis, I'm very well uh, I'm in the knowledge about uh, organizations in St. Louis. And we also have a partnership with an organization called Henry's Cares. And we have a fund for folks who are in financial need for um, a number of different areas. So food, rent, utilities, et cetera. Um, if that sounds like something you might need, reach out to me, we can set up a meeting, um, talk about that. And um, it's being underutilized and the funds need to be used. So. Um, please let me know. And the last thing is I'm going to be posting a poll in the Slack for when would be the most convenient times for y'all for me to have like an office hour situation. Um, so I'll do two sections of 30 minutes each, maybe one on a weekday, one on a weekend to make it more accessible. Um, just so you can pop in and ask general questions that you feel like you haven't had a chance to ask um, either about like a career in coding, like getting support from Launch Code, um, any, anything, truly. I'm just here to provide resources and direct you to the right place and get you the information you need and overall support you. It like brings me so much joy to interact with y'all and help y'all in whatever way I can. Um, and so just let me know. I'm available on Slack and I have um, alternative methods of contact in my um, description on Slack. So. Nice to see y'all. Have fun learning about polymorphism and inheritance today. That sounds extremely exciting. And I know nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, anybody have questions for Taylor before she hops off? All righty. Thanks again. Feel free to stick around if you want to learn about it. <laughs> All right, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. There we go. Come on, perfect. We are family. All right, who knows where this meme's from? It's, it's Creek. Creek. It's Creek. Right? It's Creek. The oh, third greatest God. show ever created during, well, that I figured out or found out about during COVID. Did take the whole, I think, month of June to finally go through all of them. Really helped out. All right. We're going to learn why we're family here today. We're going to be going over inheritance. Inheritance is what we're going to be learning today. Let me make sure I have everything here before we get going. Go. Good, 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 good. Going to go to the correct channel. Awesome. Go down to the actual. <laughs> now I'm just seeing the polymorphism. There you go, something like that. Awesome, awesome. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and hop into it. As always, we're gonna start with announcements here. So first things first, assignment number two is coming up. The due date is slowly approaching. Make sure that you're at least reading into assignment two. Uh, as you have probably noticed, we're gonna to continue to build upon restaurant menu throughout this unit. We're not gonna be switching around like we did last unit. We're gonna keep building onto it. So just read into you know, assignment two at the very minimum to see exactly what you have to do for this upcoming assignment. That being said, please make sure that you have your assignment one done, finished. That is the beginning concepts of Java. So wanna make sure that those are across the line so you have that, or so that we know that you have that understanding about those concepts before you start approaching these different ones for assignment number two. So please make sure you reach out to your colleagues, your fellow colleagues, your TAs, TFs, myself. Remember, Calendarly is available to you if you want to schedule one-on-one -on -one time with me to do any of that tutoring. But also your TAs, TFs are also out there for that as well. All right. Any questions before we get started here with this section? Anything at all? 
And if you haven't already, it has been extra quiet today. Please get that coffee and those snacks going. I need some people to talk to me today. Please and thank you. No one even has their lights on. Someone even is blocking their camera. No one even wants to talk to me. Taylor, thank you for having your camera on and talking to me. Thank you. Grab those coffees, everyone, because we're going to start talking about maps. Isn't that fun? Tell me this, creating a data structure that contains pet names and associated IDs. How exactly are we going to do that? What in here is telling us, or what do we need to use exactly? Asking you this question, what kind of tool are we gonna have to use? A hash map. Hash map. Use a hash map, absolutely. Hash maps, this kind of question indicates that we need to use a hash map because it says we need to contain two things, pet names and associated IDs. Now, what are the two parts of hash maps? Keys and, key and value. Keys and values. Tell me what's very special about keys. They don't change. Keys technically don't change. I like that. But there's one very, very specific thing about keys that we always need to keep in mind. What is that one thing? They're always strings. Wow. They don't always have to be strings. They can be integers. They can be technically booleans. They can be any data type. They, have to they be don't unique. repeat. They're, they're they don't repeat. Unique. They are unique. They are unique. Very, very good. Keys always have to be unique. Do you want you and your neighbor to have the same key to your house? Probably not. Even if you get along with your neighbors, you want to have individual keys for individual houses, just like your hash maps. So tell me this. When it comes to pet names and associated IDs, the pet names here is one thing we need in the hash map and the IDs is the other. So for the key, it must always be unique. So out of the pet names or the IDs, which one should be the key? IDs. ID. Very good, the ID should be that. And what should be the value of course? The names. Exactly, the names. It can be whatever we want. It can be something arbitrary. It can be something that's repeatable. We can have the same dog names out there, but the ID should be unique. So yes, the pet name should be the value here. Now tell me this, we're an ID. What, can, what is typically the data type for those? Or what, ID, or what data type would you want to use, per se? Int. Very good, an int. But can we use INT inside of hash maps? No. No, right? Actually, that's one thing we haven't really dove in too much. Even with array lists, we actually can't use primitives inside of array lists nor hash maps. We cannot use primitives inside of array lists or hash maps. So in this case, you are correct. It should be an integer, but with a capital I. And then pet names, who can give me that data type? String. Very good, strings, absolutely with that capital S there. So if we bring out that hash map, what's the keyword we use to start building a hash map, of course? Hash map. Very good, hash map. Yes, of course, I gave you the answer there. I'm trying to help everybody, getting those cogs going. It is a Monday. Hash map. And then tell me, where does the key go and where does the value go? Key goes on left or right? Left. 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 Very good. Left. And the value will go on the right. So this is how we're going to set up our hash map for this exact question. So there we go. We're going to go ahead and make sure that we actually do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this little program that I built. This is lecture six program. I'm going to my program class. We talked about this before and I wanna bring it up to you all, but you'll see program more and more often. This is always where the starting or my main is going to be in majority of applications. I call it program. You'll see it consistent through other applications as well and sometimes in launch code. Program is where the main typically lives. We build a little, its own little house so we know where it's always stored at. So let's go ahead and build that hash map. Talk me through it, what do I start with? Hash map. Hash Very map. good, hash map. And then what was our ID's data type? String. Integer. And integer. integer. Very good. Integer fully capital. out. Integer with a capital I, and then our values were strings. Awesome. Okay. Then we mm -hmm. called it my pet shop. Equals, and then talk me through this part. New hash map. Very good. Exactly right. New hash map. We need to make a new instance of that hash map. Very, very good. And with those parentheses at the end. You'll see here we're getting red. We're getting red because hash map is not just brought in automatically. Unfortunately, IntelliJ makes us do it. So I highlight over it with my mouse and I click import class and it brings it up here. 
We're now importing the hash map class from that Java utils. So now I can use it. There we go. We've built our hash map here in IntelliJ. Any questions before, about this before we move on? We'll get a little bit more into hash maps here in a second. Just want to get any of those other questions out of the way. Can values be non-unique? Absolutely. Absolutely. So your values, you can have as many repetitive values as you want, as long as those keys stay unique. Very good question. Yep. Because just like in our example, we can have as many dog names the same as we want because it's our value, but those IDs got to stay different. All right, let's move on. Let's bring this hash map in here. And we're going to go ahead and say, if we want to add Stark to my pet shop with the ID of one, tell me this, how am I going to do this? What am I going to use? Uh, put, like my pet shop put. Very good. Absolutely. My pet shop dot put. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We have two parameters here though. What do I do in the left and what do I do in the right? One comma and then Stark. Very good. We're going to put the key first and then our value. So my pet shop dot put one with Stark in quotes because it's a string. Very good. Exactly right. So we're going to come over here. And we're going to see what we do. My pet shop dot put one, not that one, and then Stark. And just so you all can see it, what I'm going to do now is print it out to the screen. So I'm going to say system dot out dot print mine. And then I'm going to say my pet shop dot to string just so we can see what's inside of it. All right, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and click this. Not that. Click this, then run. It's going to bring up my terminal in the very bottom here in a moment. Well, my computer wants to work with me today. Come on. And there we go. This so is what our hash map is going to look like when it's printed out to the screen. We have one equals Stark, where one again is our key, Stark is our value. All right. Let's keep going on. How about this? Add Bell to the pet shop with the ID of two. Well, again, this one's going to be very repetitive. I already heard put, so I'm just going to give this one to you. It's my pet shop dot put two in Bell. But the question I want to give to you all is how can we get Stark out of my pet shop after we've added two values to that? How can we get Stark out of my pet shop? How can we access Stark? Anybody know this one? Isn't that'll even be nice. Contains oh, value, like contains key or contains value. Isn't so it's going to be my pet shop dot, dot get. Very good, dot get, oh, absolutely. Go. Dot get is how we get things out of the hash map. And what we provide in the dot get is the ID or the key. This is why keys have to be unique because if you want to get Stark, if you want to get any of your values out there, you need to use that key to access it. Dot get gets things out of hash maps. Let's see it in action. We're going to come over here. We're going to say my pet shop dot put, and we're going to put, you know what? We're not even going to use Bella. Give me somebody, give me a dog name. Give me a bad dog name or a cat name. Scooby. Luna. I heard Scooby. First, but because I'm being nice, I will put Luna in there too. <laughs> All right, and then someone remind me, how can we get Scooby out? What am I gonna type here? I'm gonna type it in here so we can get it. My pet shop dot what? Get. And what I'm gonna put inside those parentheses to get Scooby. ID. What two. ID exactly? Two. Two. two, very good. Yes, awesome job though. You are absolutely right though. Put that key in there. Fantastic, let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. Fingers crossed, please give me Scooby-Doo, or just Scooby, just probably goes by Scooby. Wow, oh, awesome. I'll just tuck that down a little bit, I just spilled on myself. There we go, Scooby is now being printed out. Fantastic, all right. So Scooby is pretty printed out. We use that docket to get it outside of our hash map. Any questions about that? Why I'm going so much into hash maps is because if you haven't taken a look at assignment two, things and also even assignment one, hash maps are a pretty big deal with it. And I wanted to make sure that there was clarification around it as we move forward. All right, let's keep going. How can I get all of the keys from the hash map? How can I get all of the keys back? I'll start you out. Anybody know that method? Each 
He said, I heard it. Yes, absolutely. He said dot he said will return in a set of the keys that are inside of the hash map. Let's see what that actually returns. We'll say my pet shop dot he set. There we go. And we will rerun that. And we should be getting back a set with one, two, and three in it. Very good. There we go. We see one, two, and three. That's how we get our keys. But you're probably asking, okay, that's great. You got one, two, and three. What exactly do we need to get the key set? And the question is now to you is how can we print each of the values in the hash map? For each. Exactly. A for each. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay. Uh, there we go. We can only get a value with a key. So you are absolutely right. We need to use a for loop to loop through those keys. So we do a for each by using that colon in the middle. Now, if you haven't seen before how we can loop through each of these values is that on the right hand side, what we can do is that we can include the key sets as what to iterate through. We can iterate through the set so we can go through one, two, and three. And what's coming outside of that set is the key. So what we're iterating with is that key three times. So we have the integer key here. So now how we get each of those values is that we're gonna print it out to the screen using just system.out.println and that dot get method, that dot get method. So let's go ahead and see this actually in action. Talk me through it. How do I exactly loop through each of the values in my hash map? What do I start with? Four. Four. Very good, four, awesome, four, four. all right. Integer. What Integer, Integer with a capital I integer, and it's going to be called the key. Yeah. That's what's inside the key set. Which leads us to our next question. What comes next? My pet shop. My pet shop. Very good. Dot. Key set. Awesome. Two. Not entry set. Key set. Key set. You can also use entry set if you wanted to to look through it also. But we're not going to talk about that. System that out that print line. Look at that. Me being nice. All right. And then my pet shop. And then what do we use to? retrieve things from the hash map one by one yeah. very good dot get we use the key you're very good or very right but we use the key inside of the dot get so yes get and we put the key right inside of there there we go let's go ahead and run this and see what we get now we're seeing we get stark scooby and luna on their own separate lines we are getting all the values out of the hash map look at that we started out our class perfect. We got all of that. And also very good at like just naming all those functions. Like air high five to everybody. Yeah. Unit two last time. Never one knew the entry set stuff. I'm like, I'm happy to go over it. All right. Fantastic. We were starting this class out strong. Need some more smiles though. Just saying, but it's okay. It's okay. Thank you, Wima. All right. <laughs> Let's keep going here. Unless there's any more questions, that is all I have for hash maps. Any questions about those? Uh, those particular structures. <laughs> Thank you, Regan. All right. Well, then let's move to something that is ex extremely happy. In a far massless future, let's talk about going to a family reunion. Even though we're finally getting back some normality, right? Maybe not. I've seen some shaking. No, I don't want to go to a family reunion. Well, today we have to go to a family reunion so we can understand some things. So let's bring in some family members here. We have grandpa, we have our sister or a brother and another family, things like that. We got a bunch of people. So they're all gathered around, hopefully with masks or at least like, hopefully everybody's healthy. And we're just, and one of the kids asks, grandpa, how did I get my blue eyes? Simple question, kid just being cute and innocent. But let's it's go ahead and recessive. talk about- It is definitely recessive. That is correct. I remember that one from my, uh, is it genealogy? Genealogy class? I don't remember. I'm planning but, on being a geneticist, specializing nice. in connective tissue disorders and just like abnormalities of the 12th chromosome. Because gotcha, I have twice gotcha, 12th nice. P. Well, you're going to love this example then. We're going to be talking about our eye color as we move down. So let's go ahead and talk about, as always, our family tree. We're going to answer that kid's question. Grandpa has blue eyes. Grandpa passed it down to his kids, his, um, his son and his daughter. And as it moves down, it moves to the towards the children's too. Yes, this family all has blue eyes for whatever reason. So yes, it moves down to the kids. And then the sister also moved it down to her child as well. Grandpa had blue eyes. His kids had blue eyes. His grandkids had blue eyes. It passed down. It was inherited. This is called 
inherited, AKA inheritance. They inherited the blue eyes. Here we go. This is inheritance. Isn't that easy? Mic drop, we're done. That's the end of the class. Inheritance is finished. But let's just take a look at one more example just in case. So if we're having our grandparents uh, moving down to the child and everything like that, say instead of maybe a family reunion, we're gonna look at what we've been doing most of the class. We're gonna look at animals. So what we wanna do is that we are going to, second here, da, 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 there we go. So we wanted to look at an animal's family tree. It's gonna be looking a little different. We're gonna start with animal at the top. We're gonna have pet as one of its children. And pet can be a dog or a class. We're getting more specific there if you didn't notice. Let's look on the other side. Let's say we wanna do maybe wild here. And then on wild it's fox. Now take a pause, take a breath, look at this tree. It's gonna be very important. We started at animal. We broke animal down into two different classes or two different styles, pets and wild animals. Under pets, we broke it down into house, uh, household pets, a dog and a cat, very simplistic examples. Under wild, we broke it down to fox. When we look at this tree, we went from the most general text possible, animal, and we broke it down into something very, very specific, dog, cats, foxes. Pay attention to that and note that as we move forward. Now let's take a little bit of a programmatic look at it. Say we want our animal class to make a sound. Simple make sound method. It's gonna print out roar or something like that. We don't actually know what an animal does, it's so arbitrary. Well, when it comes to inheritance, and if all of these are in its family tree, automatically our pet and our wild class also have make sound inside of it as well. It's inherited. Same with the dog, cat, and fox class. It's all inherited. If our grandparent has it, if our super class has it, if our top of our lineage tree has it, we all have it. All of our classes, our children classes have it, AKA our parent class methods are carried down to our child classes, which are carried down to our child classes. It's inherited. This is the basis of inheritance when it comes to Java programming. So right here, I'm gonna pause real quick before we start looking at a few more examples. Any questions about what we just went through and what I just drug you through? All right, let's take a few more looks here before we dive into it, just in case if, any, if there's any more confusion out there, which this is a new concept so I can really understand if there is. Let's go ahead and say we are gonna create a video game. We already talked about a few video games here today. So let's just talk about that. Honest truth, I was absolutely addicted to World of Warcraft when I was in like high school, like it got to be a problem, right? I see some hands, loved World of Warcraft, don't judge me. I was a level 32 mage, undead, horde all the way, whatevs. Anyway, let's talk about this. We're gonna start at the character class here. Now you can think of more like either World of Warcraft, Halo, where, whatever game you really like the most here. And we're gonna split our characters into two teams. They're the red team class and the blue team class. Now, if we're continuing to develop this video game, <laughs> see it's some horde, heck yeah. We have the red team class and the blue team class. We can even make this more specific into saying, okay, red team only has an elf class and a human class. Well, the blue team has the orc class and the dwarf class. If you've ever played these kinds of video games, you know that each type of character has different specialties or different things that it can do and can't do. But we also know that all of the characters have things that they all have in common. They can typically all move. They can typically interact with their world. That would be at the character class. Red team maybe has other specialties than blue team. We can specify that at the red and blue team layer and then get more and more specific as we move down and get more granular into our class designs. This is how the family structure truly works inside of Java. Now for all of you that do not like video games and kind of be like shaking their head like, no, Kyle, I actually have a life. Well, you know what, fine, I have an example for you too. Uh, let's create a parking app. Excuse me, allergies are so killing me right now. <laughs> Let's say for a parking app, we need to specify exactly what kind of vehicle is there and how much to charge them for parking. Of course, vehicle is a very general term. So we start with the vehicle class. We can break this into more granular things, bikes and cars. Bikes might be different or charge different than cars in whatever regard. 
bikes also can mean multiple things. It can mean a pedal bike or a motor bike, or maybe one of those line bikes, anything like that. You can break it more granular and do specific things with that class. Same with cars. Maybe it's an electric car or a gas car. You want to charge those differently for whatever reason. This is how we can really make things more specific inside of there. So when we're talking about inheritance or even the family trees of classes, we're talking about starting at something very, very general where things are all the same. They have a lot of things in common and bringing it down to more granular classes with their own types of structures and functions or methods that they can do. All right. <laughs> Chris, oh my gosh. Uh, so I did not play StarCraft II. We're taking a quick break here. Any questions uh, from anybody here? I've seen, <laughs> I'm always not all just jokes. I'm going to let you guys unmute yourself for a second. Any questions about what we just went over about inheritance, about family structures of classes and how to make those more did granular? You know, did you know they recently, research recently found that there's actually health benefits from video games? I don't doubt that at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> also, um, also, you know, neither of those two categories really have anything to do with me because I don't drive and I don't play too much in the way of video games, but I do like do a lot of different puzzles and stuff. So I guess like it could be like the different types of Sudoku and blah, 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 you know, okay. like instead of for like some Sudoku versus the um versus like regular math sudoku or any quality sudoku like there's different types as well as like kakuro and stuff exactly right so you can take any kind of puzzle game break it down to a more general type so sudoku or just uh, a, another type of puzzle but then you broke down sudoku even more so yes you're absolutely correct that's how we can make our class structure more granular well, it still has some things in common at the parent level. So very good, absolutely right. Any other questions? Any other questions at all about any of our structures that we went through? I got one from Maggie. Is inheritance limitless, i.e. generation after generation after generation? Technically, yes. If you want it to be limitless, yeah, you can make it as granular as you want. Remember, once you do that, you're gonna have to upkeep all of those classes. So make sure that when you get that granular, it's for good reason. But yeah, if there's a necessity, you can keep going as long as you want. Yeah, absolutely. There's no caps to your lineage here in Java classes. Awesome. Or one person to get themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have any questions? All righty, let's keep moving on then. Thank you. I'm going to switch to water. Okay. One big classy family. Let's go ahead and talk about now actually inheritance, bring a little bit more code into it. As always, we're going to have our pet class and we're going to have this dog class. We know that dog is a pet. So what we're going to do today is kind of define a lineage with that. So we're going to focus on pets right now. Pet class can have all of our other stuff. I can have dogs, cats, parrots, things along those lines. So when I'm designing the pet class, I have to keep that in mind. Who are going to be my children? Who am I gonna design for? And what will they all have in common? So when you're designing your parent class, keep in mind what all of your children will have in common and place the code in there. Why do we do this? So we don't duplicate our code. We'll see this more as we move forward. Bringing in our pet class, it's just as we defined it before, public class pet, nothing has changed. As always, what goes at the top of our classes? Who can tell me, who can mouth it out? If you said class variables, I completely agree with you. We're gonna give this, cow, this pet some class variables, AKA a pet's gonna have a name. After that, our second thing starts with a C, what is it? Constructors. Constructors, constructors, constructors. You go class variables, constructors. In this one, we're gonna just take in a pet's name because our pet needs to have a name. And we're gonna set it to the class variable. And then finally, our third thing, excuse me, methods. And specifically in this case, we're just gonna create a getter. It's gonna be very simple here. We can also do a setter in the future, but I don't want anybody to change my pet's name once I decide what it's going to be. So I'm gonna just do a getter. And then of course, after all this is all other methods. Now, just real quick for all of your benefits, I 
took the time just to do the pet class real quick, did this string name, did our constructor, and then our did our getter. Excuse me. So that pet class is already created. So let's go ahead and move on to the dog class here. Public class dog. Now I know that we designed this parent class, the pet class, for the dog to take over. But how exactly do we connect this dog class with the pet class? How do we define its lineage? How do we define its family tree? How do we use inheritance? And the answer to that is using the keyword extends. Extends pet. This word right here attaches the dog class to its new parent class, the pet class. When that happens, all of the code that's in the pet class gets injected into the dog class behind the scenes, aka it's there, but you don't see it because you're not going to double, double write your code. That's what's so nice about inheritance. You don't have to double up that code. You don't have to give your dog a name. It's already in the pet class. So there is one specific thing, one special thing we have to do with inheritance so it actually works properly. And it's within the constructor. You still have to build a constructor, even though it's inheriting the one from the pet class. But not only do you have to create a constructor, but you have to communicate with the previous or your parent constructor. You still have to call back home sometimes. Still have to call to your parents. They always want to hear from you once in a while. And in this case, how we do that is with the keyword super. Super communicates back up to our parent class, our pet class, and transfers that information over there. So it passes the name back up to the pet constructor so it can set the variables within it. This is how we can again communicate with the code in the previous or our parents class in the pet class. So this is how we essentially work with inheritance at a very, at the tip of the iceberg at the very beginning state. So real quick, any questions about what we just saw? If you use this name dot name in your child class instead of the super, will it mess anything up? You, if you inherit something, that's a great question. If you inherit something, you must use super. If you inherit something, you must use super. You'll be yelled at. And super must be the first thing that you call. But to answer your question, Wima, if you do this dot name equals name below super, it will still work properly because this dot name is accessible because you inherited it from the pet class. But you'll basically be duplicating what the, your parent class is doing for you anyway. So you wouldn't want to do that because it's duplicating code, but it still would work. Does that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sweet. Any other questions before we see this thing in action? I have a question. Yeah, um, please. Well, it's more like, so to, to set the dog name, can you use a, like a set, like set name? Yeah, absolutely. So if you wanted to change your dog's name after the constructor, you'd use a setter. But remember, the constructor runs first to build your dog object. The constructor so you, always runs first. So you would have to add super first and then use a setter. Exactly. You would always have to run the constructor first. But if you wanted to change your dog's name after the fact, then you'd want to do a setter. But to answer your question, the constructor is going to set the dog's name first in this case. It's going to set the dog's name first. If you wanted to change it after, then you'd use a setter. So it'd be setting the dog's name for a second time if you used a setter. Okay. Does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay. I just need an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll go ahead and take a look at an example right now. Let's go ahead and build what we just saw. All right, so I have my pet class built, but I have my dog class here. Let's go ahead and build this thing. So what was, I have my pet class built. What was the thing that I used to attach my dog class to my parent class, the pet class? Extend. Very good, extends. And then what do I type? Pets. Pets, very good. The name of my parent class I wanna attach myself to. Very good. Now look at this very, very closely. I got an error right away. It says there's no default constructor available in pets.pet. 
Default constructor means that there's no uh, an empty parameter uh, constructor. Default we'll get an S. Uh, did you say I forgot an S? Yeah, pets, right? You put pet in there. Pets is the package name. Well, pet oh, is the yeah, class. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, no worries. So what this red line means is that I need to create the constructor. And basically tells me right here, create the constructor matching super. I'm not gonna take that shortcut. We're gonna do this long way because we love taking the long way, right? So let's go ahead and create that constructor. Someone talk me through it. How do I create this constructor for the dog? Public. Very good. Public, what's next? Dog. Dog. Dog, all right. And what's in here? String name. Very good, string name, awesome, awesome. And then what goes inside of here? Super name, right? Super. Okay. Okay, super and then name. We're gonna pass this parameter that we take inside the constructor and put it into super. Then where does super go? Who is it talking to? Uh, but, okay. uh, going, very good. It comes back over here and talks to this constructor to build our object for us. It's gonna phone home. or building a grand old ET right here. So there we go, right? I know old movies, I've seen ET. I'm awesome. All right. Anywho, that's what Super does. It's going to phone back to our original parent class, that constructor there, and set up our dog object. All right, let's go ahead and see what we exactly have to do with this. So we've set this up. Any questions about the code before we move forward? We have to see a few more things if we're actually able to see it in action, if you will. So could we make it work like um, in a different way? For example, you can have a class named Toyota, and then under Toyota extends different models. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is exactly what inheritance was built for. So yeah, if you had a Toyota class and then you had I'm terrible at cars, but a bunch of Toyota cars, you can extend Toyota class on all of them. Just like a typical lineage, one like um one parent class can have multiple children, but one child can only have one parent. Okay. So it can, has to go like that. You can't extend multiple classes. You can only have one parent. Uh -huh. So please note that you can only have one parent. You can't extend multiple classes. So choose wisely. All right, great question. Any other questions before we move on just a little bit more? Hi, uh, pet is over here, uh, the base class, right? The pet is technically the base class in this, in this um, example. Okay. In, in, in a way. We'll talk about a more base of base class here in a little bit. But yes, it is technically the base class, the parent class of this of this um, family tree here. See one person typing. What do you do if something fits into more than one category? So in that case, if it fits into more than one category, that means that you're going to have to redefine exactly where those categories are are splitting so that that would be a difficult one if you have a specific example uh, that might help out a little bit more because i'm drawing up a blank to to situation there so yeah katie do you have an example no i'm trying to think of one okay let me know if you I think of one and we can talk about that how, yeah, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Let me know if you think of one and we can talk through exactly what there are. There are options, but regardless, if it's in one more than one category, it's more like you have to take design more into account than actually coding. Um, but there have been situations that's ran into that. Um, and it might help out with interfaces next time that might uh, combat that. So maybe that will help. But let me know if you think of any situations. Okay. I see one, uh, if you have pug class that extends dog, will the constructor have super name? Technically, yes, because if you extend the dog class, the dog class also has a constructor you need to phone home to. So, and we'll see an example of that, but if we call, if we create a pug, if we create a pug class that extends dog, dog class has a constructor, so we have to phone home. But once that's phoning home, it's going to go to that super and phone up to the pet. So it builds that family tree as we move forward with those supers. So I know that's a little bit of a tricky one to, to possibly visualize right off the bat. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right. You'd have to have that super inside of your constructor as well there too. Do -do -do. 
All right, let's keep moving forward. And that might help out answer some more questions as we keep going here. So um, one thing we wanna do, if we wanted to define just our dog class, we do it exactly the same. Even though it has now inherited pet, we still create our dog the exact same. And you still call to the methods the same as well. This one right here, this will still get that name, even though it's inside the pet class. Let's go ahead and see that real quick in action. We'll go back to the program because that's where my starting point is. I'm gonna comment out our hash map example from a previously. And we're gonna say dog, my dog equals new dog. Give me a dog name out there. Anybody got one? Bart. Say Bart. I hear Bart. <laughs> Let's do it. System.out.println. And what we do is, and what I'm going to do is import this real quick, just so we have that out of there. Import class, just so we can see it. We can say my dog dot, and look at this. We have the get name method, but if we go over here, there's no get name method inside of dog. What's going on? Welcome to inheritance. We just saved ourselves a bunch of code because we were able to get the code from pet, bring it in the dog, and now we can access it through our dog class. We're having a great Monday. Look at that. I'm losing my mind over here. It's so awesome. Look at that, get name. Let's go ahead and run this, make sure it works. Let's hope we get Bart out on the terminal and we do, fantastic. So like we said, we create the dog class the exact same. It has those methods in there because we inherited from the pet class. We're able to access all that information. Mic drop, we're done there. All right, anything else? Any questions before we move on? We dive a little bit deeper now. Are we about to um, review what a class inside of a class looks like? Class I'm sorry, a class inside of a class. class inside of a class? We will take a quick look at that one. I believe I have an example somewhere in here. Okay. So let's go ahead and see what else I got here. So I have my public class pet on the left-hand side with all that code we've had in there previously. Then we have our dog over to the right. But the question is, what if we wanted our pet to make noise? We saw that example previously in the lecture. So the pet, if I asked you what noise does a pet make, though you might think, okay, well, it probably barks, it probably meows or something like that. That's not a pet, that's a dog or a cat. A pet is a very generic, wow, well, a very generic title for something, a very, very general thing. So we don't exactly know what noise a pet makes, but we still want all of our pets to make noise. We still want our dogs, our cats, our parrots to make those noise. So we need to tell them that they need to have a make noise method in there. So what we do is that we say public and we introduce a new keyword called abstract and then say void make noise. So I have our return types in there, we still have our method names, but instead of semicolons, or excuse me, instead of curly brackets, we put a semicolon here. What exactly is this doing? This is forcing all of our future children to define a method called make noise. This is forcing all of our children's, all of our children from here on out, even our grandchildren, our grand grandchildren to make the make noise method. That's the power of the abstract keyword. Again, pay very close attention that we end this with a semicolon. So once we define this, the instant we define this, we'll get errors in all of our children because make noise is not defined there. So immediately we have to go ahead and create it. So we say public void, and then of course make noise, the exact name of the method. And then there's one more step. We need to add an annotation. You've seen this one before, at override, to let our parents know that we are creating our make noise function or method as requested. And then finally, the easy part, make that dog bark. We put our code inside of the method. Do not forget this annotation. It absolutely helps. So let's go ahead and see this in action as well. We have our pet. And down here, we're gonna do all other methods. As always, we have those four parts, three if you wanna count it, so public. And then what was that keyword? that stops or that forces all of our children to make a method? Abstract. Abstract. Void, and then make noise. 
If you're asking yourself, can you do a different kind of return type for an abstract class? You absolutely can. You can do whatever, uh, whatever data type you want as your return type. I just have there and there for that. All right. One more thing that I forgot, and this was an issue inside of this, is that once or uh, inside of these, this lecture is that once we include abstract here, we have one more thing. We are saying that this class is a different kind of concept now. This is a very general class that I'm going to force my children to do special things with. So I need to add the keyword abstract above. We need to put abstract because we just created now an abstract class, a very general type of class that other children are going to be created off of to make something more specific. So take a very close look at that. Once we add this abstract void in here, or it's anything kind of abstract, we have to add abstract up here. So I apologize for that small mistake in lecture. I'm going to take a note of that real quick. So I'm going to change that in the future. But we just created our first concept of an abstract class. So welcome to the world of abstract classes. We'll talk a little bit more about what exactly these things are here in a moment. But let's go ahead and fix this problem. We have one related problem. It says that we don't have make noise method defined inside of our dog class because it extends pet. So we're gonna have to go ahead and do that. Talk me through this. How do I exactly create this method now to make this thing happy? At override. Override. Very good. We'll start with the annotation. I like that. Override. Very good. And then what's next? You have to have the same signature as the parent class method. Very good. What was that signature? Public, Public uh, abstract void. Public void. We get make rid of noise. the abstract. We no longer need that keyword abstract. Very good. Public void make noise. Do not include abstract when you're defining it in your children. We get rid of it at that point. Abstract basically in the parent class says, make sure this is there. And we get rid of it when we move on to the children class. Say system.out.println, and we say bark. Just like that. And now everybody's more happy. So this is how we create our functions off of an abstract class. So any questions about this? <laughs> so you can't, uh, you can make it return something like a string or? Absolutely. So of course I'm gonna be changing the signature here. So I have to do this, return something. I didn't spell that right, but you get the point. String. And then I'd have to come over here and change this. But now everyone's still happy. I can return whatever I want. Okay. Great question. Anything else? All right. So move on a, move on a little bit more Whew, and take a quick breather. Let's complete this code. If I wanted to bring on all the properties and methods from the vehicle class, if I wanted to bring things in from this parent vehicle class, what is the keyword I have to use? Extend. Extend. Very good, extends. What if we wanted to customize my honk method in the car class inherited from the vehicle class? What would we have to include here? Override. Override. Very good, override, awesome, awesome. If I wanted to use the two string method on a whole number, what would I include here? String. It's going to be a whole number, so I want something that holds Integer. the number. Integer. Integer with a capital I, because if I put INT in there, two string doesn't exist on primitives. Remember, two string does not exist on primitives. Those helper methods do not exist on primitives. Lowercase uh, letter, yeah, lowercase letters only exist on these uppercase letters. These non-primitives. Awesome, awesome. All right. Let's keep going forward a little bit more. We're gonna go through more examples. I see, Katie, your, your question about how does this keep me from my cat barking? We're gonna to try to go into a little bit deeper examples here uh, at the end. I just have to get through a few more concepts and we'll go back and we'll take a closer look at stuff. All right, providing outline for classes. What kind of pet do you have? You could reply, and we kind of went over an example of this. We can say dog or a cat. 
dog or cat is the type of pet you have. You don't say, I have a pet. No one says, what kind of pet do you have? I have a pet. And everyone's just gonna like turn their head and you like, are you just being sarcastic right now? That's because again, pet is a very general term. It's a very general type of class or structure we can build. So we have pet and we have more defined classes, our dog class and our cat class. Cat is the general type. And we use that to build more specific types, which are dog and cat. When we have this kind of structure, when we have this kind of structure, this is indicating that our pet class should be an abstract class. When we have this kind of situation, say maybe in a restaurant menu, you have a restaurant item, but we have vegetarian and or omnivore, or whatever you wanna do. If you have something more general that can be broken down, it's an indicator that that class should be abstract. Remember that. This is that situation that we would be looking for. So in that case, as you already saw it, how do we create an abstract class? We've seen it once now. What keyword do we of course use? Abstract. abstract. Very good. We say public, abstract, then class, and then the name of the class. This is how we build that abstract class here for pet. So question is, what exactly sets us aside from a standard class? What is different from it? Well, we already know that we use this to create more specific classes. But one other big thing that you cannot do inside or with an abstract class, you cannot create an instance of it. There is no way you can create an instance of an abstract class. It is there to be a structure is there to help you define more specific structures, but it cannot be built itself. Let's see that in action. We go over here to the program, and I try to create a new pet. I say pet, equals new pet. And I say start. I can bring in pet all I want and import the class, but the second I do that, it's gonna be like, what are you trying to do? You are trying to instantiate an abstract class. You cannot do this. You cannot build an instance of an abstract class. So just remember that as a very, very, very um, common thing I've seen in, in some assignments. So I do just want to really uh, stress that as much as possible. So any questions about that in particular? Oh, can you repeat what you just said? You broke up. Did I, I apologize. You cannot create an instance of an abstract class at all. Zero. So there's no, um, so basically I've seen that again in a lot of assignments. So that's why I'm trying to really stress that. So hopefully that came through a little bit better. So any more questions about that in particular? So does that mean you won't have any constructors in your abstract class? No, you absolutely would. Because remember, you still want to do super. Your constructor is there to build something more generic. So let's go ahead and take a quick look because I think this will hopefully help. Let's go ahead and build a cat class. We have our cat class here and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do just as we did with dog, public cat string name. And we're gonna say again, how do we communicate with our constructor in our, in our parent class? Extends. That's how we For attach it. Super. Super, super in the constructor, very good. Super in name, and now that's a great question, or that's a great thing. Where do we need to put extends? Right here. Yeah. Right next to cat. There we go. So now we are extending this. And of course we have to do the make noise. So we're gonna implement that method. It's a way to easily do it. You click that, press okay. And it does it for you. It adds that override, creates that make noise. And instead, I'm going to say system.out.println. So Katie, to your question, how does this keep you from making your dogs meow or your cats bark? It's because we are defining the make noise method now inside of the cat class. So in here we say meow. So what happens here if you don't have the override? Is there like a default or it just breaks it? Technically, Java can be forgiving sometimes, but it can break it. 
in more complex cases. That's why it's the best way to put the overwrite here to protect yourself against it. Java will try to help you out a little bit, but it's not as helpful as JavaScript. So the annotations are there to protect you from any possible cross-contamination, if you will, from other things that you might inherit or implement. So basically, you really need to have it. Yes, I would highly recommend you. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer the original question is how can I keep my dog from meowing? Well, we know that the dog class has created its own make noise with bark in it and cat with the meow. So I have my dog, I'm gonna say dot make noise. And I know my headphones are about to die here soon, so I apologize if I cut out. Cat, my cat. Give me, someone give me a cat name. Fergus. Uh, you guys are giving me the complicated names. I hope this is how you kind of spell it. Yep. <laughs> awesome. All right, and then I'm gonna do a second system that out for the cat. Now look at this. I just had to switch my variable names to my dog, my cat, but they have the same exact method name. Doesn't that make it easy? Let's go and run this and see what happens. Hopefully we get a bark and then a meow. There we go, we got a bark and then a meow. Well, don't pay any attention to this, it's because we switched over this to string instead of void. <laughs> so it printed out what it returned. Let's go ahead and change that back. Not quite. So, well, right. On a diagram, just you know, visualizing everything, um, all these extends are gonna be pointing to, 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 to pet or is it vice versa? Technically, uh, I mean, it depends on how you think of your diagram. Think of just lines attaching pet to dog and cat individually. Wait, so why did you just change all of those from string to void? Shouldn't they be string or returning a string? No, we weren't really returning a string. We we're just printing out bark and meow. I, I did the string thing because someone asked an example of that. So yeah. yeah, you don't really need to do it. It was, oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, and also this is returning null. Yeah, we didn't need to return string. We're printing out meow, we're printing out uh, bark. So I just put the string in there again for that example. Oh, okay, I was like, what is going on? It's printing out stuff, I forgot. So I don't have, I can't print out a void. What are you doing? There we go. All right. There we go, bark and meow. Okay, so why was I getting into this example here? The reason why I wanted to do this example is to show you what exactly we can do now with this power of inheritance. Say now in my cat class, like, okay, I need a name for my cat, but I'm gonna say from our example last time, maybe I wanna now customize my cat class to be something more specific. Say private, uh, private int num of num of toes. Because we apparently a lot of cats have different numbers of toes apparently found out last lecture. So with this now, I have a new class variable that dogs don't want to worry about. Dogs are like, I got the same amount of toes. You cats do your thing. So what we want to do is customize this class now to take in the int number of toes. Now I'm taking in a new parameter here, but oh, let me see what the problem is. Oh, okay. I was like, what are you doing? Um, but my super here still goes up to pet. My parent class could, could care less about the number of toes in my cat class. It's not its problem. All my pet class is here to do is to store and set my pet's name, as well as the make noise method as well. That's it. So number of toes, and there it goes. Can you guys... Yeah, nah. Cool. So it could care less about the number of toes. So what we can do in here is customize the cat class and say this dot number of toes equals number of toes. Just like that. And then we create our getters down here. So we say public int get num of toes. Just like that. Turn this dot num of toes. There we go. So this is how we just customize our cat class different from the dog class, even though they have the same parent. You have parents, but you are a different person. You have your own personality traits, things along those lines. So think of it that way. As you move down your lineage, there are differences to each individual and individual classes. 
So you're absolutely able to customize that as you move down that family tree. And we just saw an example of that. So in this case, we're gonna have 18 numbers of toes, whatever. So we still build this, everything still runs. So this is inheritance at its peak. We are able to customize our classes while still saving us lines of code by bringing in our parents' classes or parents' functions and variables as well. So any questions about this? And I know I got an example or a question about the cat class and stuff like that. Um, so let me make sure if anybody else has any other questions about it before we move on. I absolutely know this is a different way of perceiving code and how classes interact with each other. This is the basis of object-oriented programming and how objects interact with each other as we build these family trees, as we build these relationships with them. So it's okay if it doesn't come naturally right away, just take a breath, take a step back. It will, as we work with it, it will become more apparent to what its actual uses are and how we can actually utilize it within our applications to make them a little bit better and save us a lot of coding. All right. So let's go ahead and just do a nice, fun, true or false here as I regain my voice slowly and slightly. An abstract method cannot be defined in a child class. True. Well, it can't be, it can't actually have the abstract keyword. It can't have the abstract keyword, but it absolutely can be defined in a child class. In fact, we have to define it in a child class if it's abstract. So I know this one's always a little trippy one. This is false. It absolutely should and can be defined in the child class. Parent has the abstract method and it has to be defined in the child method. But a very good call out. We do not include the abstract keyword in the child class. Awesome there. How about this one? An instance cannot be created from an abstract class. True. True. Very good, true, it cannot. True. You can only extend one class. False. Oh. False. You can only have one parent, but you can. No. Very good, exactly. Think of it just like typical lineage. You can only have one parent, so you can only extend one parent, one class, so that is true. Okay. All right, last one. The movie Sandlot was released in 1993. <laughs> true. true. Very good, right? Found that one out, that's when I was Very born. Awesome. He was like, okay. I did not know that was Sandlot all the way back then. <laughs> Give me smalls. <laughs> all right, everyone take a breath. Take a breath. That was a lot of information. Breathe in, breathe out. Stay with me. We're almost to the end, I promise. Everybody good? One thumb up, two thumbs up, kind of halfway through. Anything? All right. Let's get into some casting. Let's bring something back that we've seen before, though. Some of the things you might have heard of. You've seen the parsing, parsing. Let's take an example of that. If I have this number as a string eight in quotes, so we know it's a string, we know that we can create an integer out of this. Does anyone remember the method name for that? To int? I think I heard it, parse int. Integer in num equals integer dot parse int. We can parse that string eight into an integer. We can change its data type using parsing. Parsing is that magical thing that we needed. Let's take a look at one more. We can typically also parse a double out of that string as well. We have the eight, we parse it in as a double. Again, using parse. This converts that value, that string, into another data type, an integer or double, depending on what kind of parser you use. So let's dive a little deeper. Why are we exactly going into any of that? Let's bring up casting. What exactly is it? Casting is kind of like parsing in the fact that it converts one class into another type of class. It converts one class into another type of class. What do I exactly mean by that? Let's bring in the pet example. We can create a pet like this. We can use the more generic term on the left-hand side, pet, and use the more specific type on the right-hand side, dog. So you're probably asking yourself, is this actually possible? It absolutely is. Take a very close look at this, what we are doing. I said that you can't create a new instance of a pet, but never said you couldn't use the pet data type. 
what we're doing here is that we have the more specific class type on the left right hand side and we have the more general type on the left hand side we're able to set create a pet or we're able to create a dog class instance and save it into a pet inside of its parent type this is something unique and it's very very helpful in java we can use the more general classes to store more specific class data types does casting work if one of them is abstract? Absolutely. In this example right now that we're looking at, pet is technically abstract. Let's go ahead and see it actually in here. I'm going to change both of these to pet. I just now created a pet data type called my dog and my cat, but my dog is created from the dog instance type. Well, my cat is created from the cat instance type. Again, I use those more specific class types and save them as a more generic data type, only the parent. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about this is that it has to be still in the family tree. I can't just come over here and say, okay, I want my pet now to be an integer or something like that. That's not possible. They're not in the same family tree. So I keep it within the family here. I have pet there, which is that, again, that more general class. So the thing is now is that once I have pet out there, pet is technically a general object. It's a pet object, but inside of it is a dog. So how do we exactly get the dog outside of this general class, outside of this pet class? That's where casting comes in. Casting is a way to get back that object into its original data type. So let's take a look at that. We have dog, dog, lowercase, equals, and then dog in parentheses, the class type we want to cast it to, and then pet. This is how we cast. It's how we turn it into another class. Take a quick look at it. Say What's the dog. benefit of doing that? That's a great question. Why would we want to do this? And that's next. Okay. <laughs> but let's go ahead and see it real quick in action. My casted dog equals dog in parentheses because we want to put the data type we want to cast it to, the more specific class typically. We say my dog. Just like that. But what happens if we do my cat? Well, let's first run this, Kyle. Don't get ahead of yourself. Let's go ahead and make sure all of this works. We're going to try to do a bark here. Run that. Let's see what we get. We see we get a bark. Awesome. We casted everything A-OK. -okay. A dog was turned into a pet and turned back into a dog. Magic trick. What happens if we try to cast it to the wrong thing? Take a close look at this. This is what you're going to see here, is that it was a required type dog, but you're trying to cast it back to a cat. Even more importantly, we have to make sure we're casting to the right thing. Let's try to do this now. I changed my types over. So now I'm trying to cast my dog into an actual cat variable. What happens here? Let's run this. We see we get a bad cast exception here. So it's going to be called a class cast exception. And what it does is that we're trying to convert something that into something it is not. Even though they are siblings, cats and dogs, if you try to turn a dog into a cat, Java is going to be mad and so will that dog. So make sure you are keeping your types consistent. Make sure you're remembering them what you're trying to cast. Um, blah, blah. So let's answer the question that I'm sure we all have at hand. Why the heck would we want to do this? The answer to that is something that we kind of touched on briefly in two lectures ago. You all remember that equals method we slightly talked about just for a brief moment? Vaguely. This is what it looked like. We had public boolean equals object object. And more importantly, inside of this equals method, we had to cast the object to something like that. So I want to make sure, I think I have to, I have to remember what it was. Let's see. So inside of here, we did public bo uh, boolean equals, and then object, 
OBJ. So the reason why the equals method exists is to see if two classes are equal. It's simplistic to see if one equals one, that's fine. But if we need to take two dog objects and see if they're exactly alike, that's something different. And that's why we have the equals methods to compare more complex things together. The first thing we did is that we said, if this equals OBJ and return true. That was the first part of our equals method. What does this if statement do? Can anyone tell me? It sees if it references the same memory address. Absolutely right. It sees if it references the same memory address. If this, which means the context of this class, the reference of this class is equal to whatever's being passed in, that same reference, if they're living in the same area, the same house, they're the same dog. That's what this is doing. It's comparing the memory addresses. If the memory addresses are the same, it's the same dog. It's the same house. So that's what this first line of the equal sign is, or of the equal method is doing. And now I'm doing this completely off of memory. So please, someone correct me if I'm wrong on, I know there's four lines to this, but I believe it was, oh, I need to look up. Does anyone have the equals method by any chance on them that's provided to them by launch code? There's four lines to it, and I want to make sure that I get all of them because it's very, very important. Um, the explain. next one checks the type of object. Okay, is it OBJ instance of? Yes. Thank you. Instance of, and then we also provide the type of the class we're in here, so dog. Does it do the not operator? Yes. Like yes. But there's a, yeah, outside of the parentheses. So it's like two sets of parentheses. Is it like that? Yes. Okay, if it's not an instance of a dog, is it a dog? No. The one the textbook gives us has um, get class method instead of instance of, but probably the same thing. Oh, we probably do that too. Got get class. Did it do it like that or? I always forget. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I know. All right. Um, yeah, I want to do just instance stuff because I always forget that annotation. Instance of. There we go. So, yeah, it's the same thing. It's checking the class types. So, basically, what kind of class they are. Then, what's the third line, Lima? Then we do cast object to dog instance. So, if dog that my dog's name, well, that's what I had on this example. So, no, no, very good. Yes, that is exactly right. OBJ, so we then cast it to this. This was that part of the equals method that we need to talk about. This is the part that maybe didn't make much sense when we were going through it the first time. And this is what we were doing. We were casting it into whatever the data type is for that equals method. And then here's where we check the properties that we truly want to check for this class to see if they're actually equal. So dog instance, we'll say that get name, if it equals, the string, so you gotta do dot get equals, um, this dot get name, then we know that they're equal. Otherwise, return false. Of course, we can always have dogs with the same name. It was just an example. Here, you can actually customize it to whatever you want to see if two classes are equal. This is where your imagination or listening to the instructions comes into play to really customize this if statement that's highlighted right now. But what I wanted to show you is that this is the reason the true big reason that we use a lot to do casting, to turn it, try to turn it back to the original object. We'll go through this. Sees if it's the same address. Sees if it's the same type of class, because if it's not a dog, it's clearly not the same. This casts it to that class type, aka a dog here. Customize. Check what you want to see if it's equal. Typically down here, especially for launch code, you're going to want to check the IDs when we get to that more fun stuff. So just a heads up there, hashtag foreshadowing. So yeah, check the IDs down here to see if those two objects are equal. But in this case, we're just going to do the names. 
just gonna keep it a little bit easier for this example. Any other questions about that? I am on the wrong screen, so if anyone's typing on the Slack, I you absolutely were, so let's see. Um, oh, thank you, Ryan, for providing that. I, I was on the wrong screen. Cool, cool. Yeah, and I'll just go ahead and put this in here too. These two are uh, basically the same thing. You can use either one if some if someone's watching this recording and needs to see it. There we go. Awesome, awesome. Fantastic. Okay. Any other questions about this? We're going to go over one more concept and we're going to come back to abstract because I still want to do that pug example that we talked about previously to kind of see a grandchild and all this inheritance stuff. But before we do that, let me real quick, we're going to blow your mind, possibly, if it hasn't already been blown today or just absolutely bored to death with inheritance. Just like your family tree, we all stem from somewhere. We've all come from somewhere, from some lineage, all the way back to whatever arbitrary thing that created all of us, right? In Java, in this system, it's the same thing. We, all of our stuff comes from somewhere. All of our stuff comes from somewhere. And that beginning class, the Big Bang class in Java, is called object. Object is where everything stems from in Java. Everything, 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 everything in Java is an object. Anything that you create at all is under the object class. So if you're asking yourself why you could place just object as the parameter type in that equals method, it's because anything you pass in there is technically an object. Hence, we can compare it to whatever we need to do by those reference values and by those other conditionals. So this is what I really want to focus on, is that we are in object-oriented programming. All of our classes that we create will stem off of object, and they all interact with each other in some regards. Inheritance is that structure in which they interact with, whether it is extending them, or as we get into the next lecture in um, implementing something, everything interacts with each other. Everything is like an or everything is an object, and that's what we need to keep in mind as we're trying to figure out what Java is actually thinking when we're going through applications. So that was the last thing I wanted to talk to you all about. Any questions about that? All right, fantastic. I see one person typing real quick, but we will also go back over here and we'll do a quick pug example and then I'll take any other examples you guys wanna see in inheritance while we still have, <laughs> while we still have seven minutes. I see a dad joke, when the ambulance zips past its siren blaring, they won't so much ice cream driving that fast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is a definite dad uh, joke. All right, let's go ahead and do the pug example here. As we already oh. talked about, we have our pet class, no, we have our dog class. Like we have that. now, we wanna make something more granular. We wanna make a type of dog. So we're gonna go in here, right click, and, uh, press the, type oh, child. You know, do you have a question? In the class, so we're gonna name it Pug. New Java class, Pug, there we go. All right, first things first, how am I going to bring in the dog class as I try not to say the word? Extends dogs. Thank you very dog. much, extends dog. Awesome, awesome. We're gonna get that error right away, instantly. So how do I fix that error? Someone talk me through it. Right, right click and uh, import it, right? It's true, but take me through the long, boring way. Add override? We're not gonna do add override for uh, when we're trying to do this one. Public. Super. Super. We're gonna be doing super, but we need to oh. do one more thing before we do super. Public. Pug. Pug, very good. We need to create the constructor. Pub, uh, public pug. And then in here, we're gonna include, of course, the dog name, because that's what all of our dogs oh. need, all of our pets need. Then what do we do in here? Super, right? Super. Super. <laughs> Absolutely right, let me put name. Awesome. Now to the, I forgot who originated the pug, uh, the pug example, but anything specific to a pug that you'd wanna build upon here in this class? 
Hey guys. <laughs> okay. We'll so say how do I start creating a class variable? What accessor do I always use? Private. I'm sorry. Private. Private. Very good. Private. We're gonna say boolean has big eyes. Did you win? As always, we say in here we say boolean. Big eyes. That's in there. And then we say this dot has big eyes equals has big eyes. Any questions up until this point? Awesome, awesome. All right. So as you can see, is one thing I do want to point out is that pug does not have an error saying that it needs to create the make noise method. Take a look at that. We don't have to do the make noise method on this one. It's because we're not extending the abstract class. Therefore, those abstract voids, that are the abstract method that we created in, me, in uh, pet, does not come down to here. And only if I extended pet here would I need to actually implement those abstract methods. But we don't have to do that. Thank God. So, could you, could you do um, um, extends dogs, extends pets? No, or no? You only extend one class, only oh. one parent. So we can't even, we cannot put extends pet here. So we'll get an error saying we're already doing that. We can't do commas, can't do any of that. You can only extend one class forever and always, only one parent per class. So you can have a step parent or something. <laughs> yeah. Robert, uh, it's because we're not inheriting the abstract class. We can come in here and take a look at it. So we take that out. You see that we're still getting that error. So it's because we are not extending pet that we don't have to implement that method. If we're only able to do one parent, then how is it like real parents because of how you have to have two parents to make a baby? So in, the, in this regard, we're gonna only say we only have one parent. So in the Java, in the Java sense, we only have one parent. So is it like one of those flowers that are both male and female? It is like Java that only wants one parent. But no, like you need both a male, a male sperm and a female egg. So is it like something that produces both the egg and the sperm? So if it's easier for you to, uh, to see it that way, absolutely. It can definitely be like that. <laughs> However it is to visualize that it's only one parent. Sorry. Um, no, no, you're okay. So would you super dog, super pet for noise? Um, so let's go ahead and we'll show, we'll see exactly what the interactions are like here with Pug. So we're gonna go back over to our program. We're gonna go over here, we're gonna create our Pug. Remember, Pug extends dog. So what happens is that we're gonna go over here and we're gonna create a Pug, Pug equals new Pug. We go. We're going to implement, or not implement, we're going to import pug. Excuse me there. All right, what's the pug's name? Mo. Mo, all right. That was Mo. There we go. And then Mo does have big, uh, big eyes. There we go. True. Perfect. All right. So if we do pug and we say make noise, we see that is able to say wolf yeah. or, or bark, excuse me, in this regard. We're able to still access the dog's methods. We're still able to say dot get name. We're still able to access pets methods as well. We're okay there. We're able to access all of our parents' previous methods and also the data that corresponds with them. Everything is called from, sorry, uh, to cut you off. So everything is called inside of the main method, right? From all those other classes, right? So we're creating we're creating instances of these classes within the main method right now, yes, because, yeah, we're, we're creating them there. And then interacting with those instances within this main class, just to kind of provide examples. Okay. So all of these classes are, all these, all these things are being built. So we have a bunch of instances of these classes inside of the main. Mm -hmm. And that's technically where they're interacting with each other. So Katie, to answer your question, so would you super dog, super pet for noise? So uh, you wouldn't have to do that. Remember, it always phones home. 
So from here, what we did is we created this pug. So what it does is it goes over to our constructor here, talks to this constructor. First line is super. What it does now, it says, okay, super, you want me to phone home. My home or my parent is dog. It goes to dog. Comes up here and runs this constructor. It says, okay, you're here. You said super. Okay, you want me to phone home. Home is pet. Comes up to pet. Comes to the constructor. It says, okay, what do you want me to do? You want me to set this dot name. So as what we just saw, it goes up its family tree to do whatever's inside of the constructor to build this object. So technically it goes through three constructors to build itself to create one instance of the pug. So I wanted to show you that's kind of how it's working and what Java is actually thinking as it's going through this. So Kyle, unless a pug for some reason made a different noise than a dog, you don't have to define it within pug. Technically, yes, exactly. But with pug, say it does create a different, uh, different sound. Um, at least the, my, my best friend's pug, uh, her pug makes a, a snorty sound somewhat. I love that dog. All right, so we're gonna say, what it does is gonna say public void make noise. Like that. So what we just did is overrode our parents class now by doing this. And we say system.out.println, and say snort, just like that. So now we're able to make this class a little bit more customized to our pug. So we come over here to program, and what we're gonna do is say pug.makeNoise. Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Okay, I'm still casting it correctly, there we go. After this, we are basically over time. There it is, and now we snort. So now our pug is making a different noise than our dog class. Again, this, as we get more granular, this is how we can customize our things. Remember, we always want to use that override if we're customizing our function or our methods that our parents have already defined. Lucy, so I can make an array list of pet objects. I can add dogs and cats to them, no problem. That is absolutely correct. You can add, if you have a program over here, and we come back over, let's say, to our hash map example also, which same thing with array list. You can say pet in here. So now instead of here, we can say, I want a new uh, dog here, some Stark, and a new cat. Hello. I have the number of toes, 18 number of toes. And now I can do a new pug. Um, what's our pug's name? Mo. There we go. So yeah, we can use that more general class to create a container for our more specific children. So great question, Lucy. That is absolutely correct. Fantastic, everybody. Great questions today. Awesome, awesome. Sorry, my voice is still raspy. But um, we are a bit over time, so if there's not any last second questions that anyone has, we are all finished. All finished. So, anything else I can help anybody else with before I let you all go? Anything else? So, all right. All right, in that case, everyone, thank you as always for putting up with me today. Hope this helped out. Hope you enjoyed seeing inheritance and what we can do and the power of classes, et cetera. But that is all I got for you. So feel free to leave us for, or leave me for your small groups. Have a fantastic week, and I will see you all back here on Thursday. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.